Good evening, Tanse Anin. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. Authorities in the U.S. have now laid new federal charges against a former Dances with Wolves star Nathan Chasing Horse, including sexual exploitation of children and possession of child pornography. Leanne Sanders has more. The new charges are in addition to state charges laid this week. And Chasing Horse remains in custody, according to this Clark County detention website. A Las Vegas judge set his bail at $300,000 yesterday. He's to have electronic monitoring and has been ordered to have no contact with the victims, minors, and cannot have firearms. Here in Canada, Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations Vice Chief Heather Bear told APTN that Chasing Horse was banned from their Saskatchewan powwow in 2015 and that his alleged victim reported the incident to police. And I, and I know there was a police report done at that time as well. And uh, I had followed up uh, with, uh, um, you know, the individual, you know, that had um, uh, filed the complaint. So there was certainly steps made, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the incident itself. She said this is another example of police not listening to Indigenous women. But there again, you know, um, when we, you know, again, there's evidence, you know, please don't take our, our, our Indigenous women and girls serious, serious enough, you know, when allegations are made or when reports are made, you know, we could have, uh, um, you know, he was out there for eight years, you know, without any justice or without any uh, follow up. And, and uh, that's the sad part. APTN News reached out to Saskatoon Police to confirm, but a spokesperson says they're not able to comment unless charges have been laid. RCMP in British Columbia confirmed that the Karameos detachment received a report of a historical sexual assault and an unendorsed warrant has been issued for Chasing Horse this week. The email explained, the subject once apprehended on the authority of the warrant must be brought before a judge or justice before they can be released. Chasing Horse may soon be facing more charges in Canada, according to Sutina Police near Calgary. Sergeant Nancy Farmer said that one of two victims Witnesses from that nation is also part of the Las Vegas and, case. Um, we can confirm that one of our victims is also one of uh, Las Vegas's victim. Um, and only primarily because there was offenses here in Canada and offenses down in the United States. APTN reached out to Alexandra Kazarian, Chasing Horse's new lawyer, but there's been no response. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Winnipeg. APTN's Edmonton-based reporter Danielle Parody has been working on a number of interesting stories, including the Chasing Horse case. She joins me now for an update on those stories. Hi, Danielle. It's great to see you on our show. Why don't we start with Nathan Chasing Horse. Uh, what details did you find out from the arrest paperwork? Yeah, the, um, the arrest warrant from Las Vegas gave us a little bit of insight into what the charges were um, in that jurisdiction. So Chasing Horse is looking at facing eight uh, felonies. Um, the majority of them are sexual assault or um, uh, pornography of a minor under 16. And then there's also um, tra sex trafficking of an adult. So we're still waiting on some details, but um, my understanding is that that may be the connection. Um, one of those charges is the connection between Satina Nation um, just outside of Calgary and, and Nevada and, and why the police have been working so closely together. Uh, I haven't heard anything as it relates to the charges in BC, but I think we'll have some more information out about that soon. And Danielle, what do we know about the alleged victims in this case as well? The victims, uh, so far as I'm aware, have all been Indigenous women, often uh, vulnerable women. If you look at the warrant, it's very heartbreaking. Um, it, it seems that there is this um, this a pattern of behavior that looks at uh, predatory behavior. So taking advantage of people that are vulnerable, people who feel that they don't quite fit into the community in some way. Um, and then also uh, we're seeing multiple, what I want to say so-called wives, because some of these, uh, some of these people were girls when they were um, 
allegedly uh, either trafficked or or given even as a gift uh, is in the warrant to Chasing Horse. So uh, and and not necessarily any evidence of paperwork or a formal marriage, but but something that the uh, that the women in this case were led to believe that they were married. And what message have police been sending out to the communities? Yeah, in, in every situation and jurisdiction that I'm aware of, police have indicated that there could be more victims. So we often see this when there are cases of um, of sexual assault or sexual violence, that there are more victims and, and people are afraid to step forward. Really heartbreakingly, um, Sergeant Farmer from Sutina had talked about how it was challenging for the people involved to take that first step and that they are, um, you know, they're often women who were abused under the context of ceremony. They were told that this was tradition and and they're still struggling with that so police are saying they're anticipating more victims and to please come forward if you if you do believe that you're a victim well we'll certainly be keeping an eye on that one and let's turn now uh, to the Cindy Dixon case out of the Supreme Court of Canada the Vonta Gwich'in woman's appeal started this week right so how did it get to the Supreme Court yeah, so this is a this is a result of a long legal battle. Um, in 2019, Cindy Dixon uh, had uh, tried to run for uh, the for the council for um, Gwenta Gwichin, and uh, she she lives in Whitehorse um, because Old Crow is a fly-in community, and um, and she has a son who has some medical needs and needs to be near a hospital. Uh, she was denied because there was a requirement to live on reserve, and that's what started this whole appeal process moving. So ultimately, what is at stake here, Danielle? Mm -hmm. So there's two very different arguments um, from one from Ms. Dixon and one from Von Kunt Uh Ms. Dixon is saying that if, um, and this is under Section 25 of the Charter, that which is traditionally a right or is, is a um, is a charter right that's supposed to help protect First Nations when it comes to self-government. Um, but Ms. Dixon is arguing that if Section 25 is used in this way, that it acts as immunity or a shield from charter rights, and that that put that violates Von Tuckwitchin First Nation citizens' rights. Uh, the nation, on the other hand, argues that it has a very robust set of human rights. Um, regulations themselves and that they never consented to the charter when they entered into their self-government agreement. So you have uh, two different perspectives on this and then we'll see where it lands. Well, a couple different stories there, Danielle. We'll certainly be keeping, in, keeping an eye out. Thanks so much for this. Thank you, Daryl. Over in Manitoba now, where $5 has become a largely symbolic payment handed out in Treaty 1 territory every year. But now a class action lawsuit wants to change that. CTV News reporter Taylor Brock brings us this story. Obviously, we want justice. You know, we're tired. Zongadea Nelson has filed a claim against the federal government for $11 billion. He is representing his First Nation and Treaty 1 First Nations in a lawsuit saying a $5 annual payment agreement from 1874 while paid each year, has remained at exactly $5, not keeping up with inflation. Obviously, $5 in current day uh, buys something entirely different than what it would have in 1871, even when accounting for the increase uh, that was paid out to the $5 increase. Zongadea started the process for this lawsuit four years ago and says his family has disagreed with the integrity of Treaty 1 since witnessing its signing. His uncle, Terrence Nelson, a Roseau River Council member, says for most people, the $5 is a recognition of the promises made in Treaty 1. It's not just the $5, and it's very, very important for people to understand there's a lot more benefits that were supposed to be there. Indigenous Services Canada says it received the claim, which was first filed in 2019 and the most recent amendment in November. It says in a statement... Honoring the treaty relationship and working together in partnership with First Nations is key to advancing lasting reconciliation. Canada will continue to work cooperatively with Treaty 1 First Nations to make progress together on shared priorities to help strengthen our ongoing treaty relationship and advance reconciliation. The treaty is a living organism, it is a relationship, and, say, and the idea of true reconciliation means that one lives up to one's bargain. Zongadea says he's asking for fair compensation. Reconciliation requires that the, the Crown to act fairly and honorably in its dealings with the First Nations people. And that's where we're at. You know, we're, uh, we're trying. <laughs> Taylor Brock, CTV News, Roseau River First Nation. 
All right, we have much more news coming up. Stick around. Welcome back to APTN National News. The Yukon government is seeking public feedback on new mining legislation. That's because they believe the current legislation does not reflect the territory's modern reality. The legislation will address mining activity like prospecting, mining operations, and the closure and remediation of sites. It will be developed in collaboration with First Nations and transboundary groups. The new legislation aims to respect First Nations relationships with the land while also supporting a competitive and responsible mining industry. We as a territory, and we need to be mindful of not only what we're doing and how we're doing it, but also every decision that we make today is detrimental to the future. But at the same term, it can be beneficial to our next generation, which I think is at the utmost importance of this. And in northern Ontario, four First Nations want the province to hear their worries about mining. The Anishinaabe community of Grassy Narrows, along with three other First Nations, recently came together to defend their territory. We spoke with Grassy Narrows Chief Rudy Turtle. Chief Turtle, thank you so much for taking some time today. What do you want done about prospecting in your territories? Well, what we're looking at is we would like to be informed every time uh, there's an application being done to uh, to prospect uh, we do get notifications but i don't consider those as uh, as proper consulting like, um, i think there should be a better way of doing it instead of just being notified that there's going to be prospecting done on such and such a day and such and such a place i guess like uh, we, we do get those but the way I look at it, they're nothing more than just notifications and letting us know what they're going to be doing. Now, you've described the mining claim system as, as a free entry system. How does this fail to live up to a duty to consult? Well, like, uh, like I just said, um, like it's nothing more than just a, a notification. Like they're just letting you know what they plan to do and where they're going to do it. Um, I think it should be much more of a, a proper, for example, a proper phone call and probably um, just uh, giving us more time and to be able to say what we have to say and, and uh, um, contact one of our technicians, like from technician to technician, and, and then go from there. And, but that's not happening right now. It's just uh, letters being sent to the man office or being sent to me. Personally, I don't have time to, you know, go be going through those uh, those uh, notifications. And we did send a letter to the ministry instructing them to uh, contact our uh, land protection workers. Now, you're, you're also calling for Premier Doug Ford to meet. Uh, how has he responded or, or has he responded? Um, I haven't heard anything. Um, hopefully, we'll hear from him soon. And, and uh, we're looking forward to meeting with him and to sit down with him and to address our concerns. Well, Chief Turtle, that's, uh, well, we'll, we'll leave it there. So I want to say thank you so much for taking a, a bit of time to sort of explain uh, the situation from, from your end. And we really appreciate the time. Okay, all right, thank you. In Nova Scotia, a new art project called Every Child Matters is now on display at the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Center in Halifax. Angel Moore has this. These 66 rugs and tapestries were created by 49 rug hookers of the Rug Hooking Guild of Nova Scotia. They're on display for the first time at the Friendship Center, located in Jabuktuk, known as Halifax. Teresa Muse is the center's cultural advisor and loves the exhibit. Oh, I just thought it was it was wonderful. Uh, we're always trying to keep the the education going on the residential school, and to me, this was just a unique way to do it. And if anything, hopefully, has opened up our minds to creating other unique ways as well. 
This project started almost two years ago, inspired by the discovery of the 215 suspected unmarked graves in Kamloops. The Rug Hooking Guild partnered with the Friendship Centre to display the exhibit. Trina Empringham is the Centre's coalition coordinator. And, and you know, they never threw it at us to say, here you go, this is what we did for you. They actually went about it in a way that to me really represents what Truth and Reconciliation is all about. Rug hooking is the craft of pulling yarn and other material through a woven base. You can see the details of Mi'kmaq hieroglyphs. That's because the rug hookers followed the designs of five Mi'kmaq artists, Tara Francis, Gerald Glode, Phyllis Grant, and Noella Moore. The installation is divided to represent the seven sacred teachings. Mew says it's an opportunity to learn. Uh, I don't think there has been a person that's come in that hasn't walked out like with a smile on their face. It, it's been a, it's, it really hits your heart to see these. Mm -hmm. A binder explains the designs and artist profiles, which are written in English and Mi'kmaq. Empringham says it was a real collaboration between the Rug Hooking Guild and the Mi'kmaq community. It gives me hope that organizations like the Guild have taken this upon themselves to do this, but do it in a way that they actually reach the community first. They got the community's buy-in for it and their support, and then they went through and did the translations. Mew says there have been over 100 comments in the guest book. And they're just all positive, and people are still saying how beautiful it is and heart heartwarming, how moving. The exhibit is on display till the end of March, and then will travel to communities throughout the Maritimes. Angel Moore, APTN, National News, Jabuktuk, also known as Halifax. All right, still to come, we'll look at tonight's Sports with Stranger and Nation to Nation. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Our very own Holly Moore sent in this setting sun near the Fairmont Hot Springs in beautiful British Columbia. It's a great shot there. If you have a great photo you would like to share with the nation, send it now to share at aptn.ca. Right now, let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Beginning on the east coast, the minus 6 in St. John's and 10 degrees in Halifax. Minus 16 in Cartwright and minus 17 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Zero degrees in Quebec City and plus one in Montreal. Plus four and some snow in Toronto and minus four in North Bay. Minus eight in Timmins and minus seven in snow in Wawa. Snow in minus 14 in Churchill and minus five in Norway House. Minus five in Barron's River and minus five in Winnipeg. Plus one in Clare and Regina and plus five in Swift Current. Minus 5 in Snow and LaRange, and minus 4 in Buffalo Narrows. Heading west, minus 13 in Snow and Fort Chippewan, and plus 2 in Peace River. 6 degrees in Clear in Edmonton, and 10 in Medicine Hat. 10 in Vancouver, and 9 in Campbell River. 6 degrees in Prince Rupert, and minus 9 in Fort Nelson. Minus 19 in Beaver Creek, and minus 25 in Snow and Old Crow. Minus 17 and snowing in Norman Wells and minus 19 in Yellowknife. Minus 26 in Fort McPherson and minus 21 in Colville Lake. Clear minus 36 in Cambridge Bay and clear minus 34 in Whale Cove. Minus 37 in Arctic Bay and minus 34 in Iqaluit. Well, you may have seen or heard the story about a new hockey card set from Upper Deck featuring all Indigenous players, but these cards are proving quite hard to come by as there are only a select amount and only one store that has them. That's this week's Sports with Stranger. 226 area code. Hello, first row. If you're looking for the new Upper Deck First Peoples rookie cards, well, it may already be too late. Hello, first row. The First People set features eight Indigenous NHL players that never had a licensed card, and First Row Collectibles in Winnipeg is the only store in the world that has them. We want to get them in the hands of our people here in Winnipeg. Yeah. We have, you know, we have so many. You know, the Indigenous community here is, is huge, but 
there's so many people up north in remote communities and there, there's uh, uh, people in other provinces so um, I'm kind of uh, saying to them, you know, as long as they pay the shipping, I'll, I'll take care of you, right? Like, and, and I'll send it up to you. Uh, so that that in itself, it's been, uh, it's been quite the undertaking. It's been pretty busy, man. Yeah. Store owner Curtis Housen says the demand for the cards is staggering, with people from all over the world calling or emailing looking to get their hands on some. But with only a limited number of sets, he's doing his best to try accommodate everyone. I was given 300 sets, and those were like almost gone within the the first the first day. Um, I, I did contact Upper Deck, and uh, we're, we're going to be getting a second shipment. Okay. We don't know how many. Um, it doesn't sound like it's going to be as many as 300 this time around. Uh, but even those, those are probably you know those will be gone within minutes yeah. as soon as we get them. The cards were designed by Jacob Alexis from the Alexis Nakoda Nation in Alberta, with the bios and research done by Name Cardinal. Even though the cards are free, that hasn't stopped people from selling them online, as you can see on these sold eBay items. It's one of those things that uh, I get it, but I don't because I, it's, it's a free set. But uh, someone just brought it to my attention. They, they, they searched eBay, and that set's going for 250 bucks, and there's like 50-something bids on it right now. Um, I, like I said, you know, I understand it, but I give it a little bit of time, right? Because it's a free set. It's a free set, right? So... Yeah, but um, the demand is definitely there. Um, uh, from what I know, the set is limited to ten thousand, and I, I think I think we might have you know might have underestimated the, the the popularity in it mm -hmm. because like my phone's always ringing off the hook, and there's yeah. people uh, messaging me and emailing me needing the set. So yeah, that's yeah, been awesome. For Housen, being able to have the cards be in his shop is an honor. Like a lot of these guys played, you know, like the Johnny Harms 50s, 60s, right? Uh, so a lot of these guys were playing at a time where it probably wasn't the easiest to be an indigenous yeah, player. Time, yeah. So it's probably a tough time to do that. So to be able to honor them and see, you know, these are the guys that paved the way for the guys that are playing now mm -hmm. and, and our, just our people and our, our culture to begin with, right? Like these are the yeah. guys that helped uprise us. So uh, it's super cool, super cool, cool and an honor to have them in this, in this store. Apart from first row collectibles, the cards are being given away at various indigenous tournaments, games and camps across the country over the next few weeks and months. And it is of course Thursday, which means it's almost time for a new episode of Nation to Nation. Here's host Fraser Needham with a preview. British Columbia's government is tackling a number of indigenous issues these days. And this includes introducing legislation to make Truth and Reconciliation Day a stat holiday in the province. We'll have Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, Marie Rankin, joining us to talk about this and more. Reg Naganobi, Grand Chief of the Anishinaabek Nation in Northern Ontario, is also here to talk about the recent bilateral health meetings, which First Nations were not invited to. And NDP MP Brian Massey has a private member's bill winding its way through Parliament. It aims to create an indigenous urban national park in Windsor, Ontario. That's all coming up on Nation to Nation. Well, you can catch Nation to Nation in just a couple of minutes, so make sure to stick around for that. That is all we have for you tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great night.